Hey folks, Gary Kelly here from gkmedia.ie, producing digital content and providing marketing solutions for SMEs throughout Ireland and the UK. The film, TV and animation sector in Ireland is estimated to be worth over 692 million euro, comprising of nearly 12,000 jobs by way of direct, indirect and induced employment across the economy. However, COVID-19 has not only halted most productions, but it has also affected the release of big blockbuster movies, it has closed cinemas and has put film festivals online. When will the industry return to work? Will it be full-time? And how will it proceed with so many restrictions and requirements in place? This week, I spoke to Irish production manager Adrian Devan about the future of the film and television industry. This is a GK Media Podcast. Well, Adrian Devan, production manager, currently remotely planning, budgeting and scheduling for film and TV productions with COVID-19 protocols. Thank you for joining us on Gary Talks. Good morning, Gary. As you know, Adrian, I love movies and you've been working in the movie and the television industry for many, many years. You've worked with the likes of BBC, Channel 4, UTV, RTE, TV3. Can you start off, if you don't mind, and as cringing as it might be for you, but do a few name drops of the sort of people you've worked with over the years. Well, I've actually worked with Gary Kelly <laughs> <laughs> back in my day. That was, I was, that was the low in your career. I was on the stage with, with Gary Kelly, which, which were very fun times. But uh, so later, I suppose I went from Galway up to Dublin and started working on commercials and music videos um, in the late 90s and was lucky enough to get a job on Ballycus Angel in Ardmore Studios. I didn't leave for about eight years because Disney came to town and um, uh, Spyglass Entertainment came in with the Count of Monte Cristo and they stayed then with the likes of Reign of Fire, King Arthur, Veronica Guerin. And I was lucky enough to um, work under the producers there as a producer's assistant and a production trainee. So I learned my craft and my, I suppose, got my knowledge there from the Americans and uh, brought it on then to, to Irish independent films then. But you asked me about names, um, the likes of Christian Bale and uh, Matthew McConaughey, Gerard Butler, back in the day when he wasn't really well known. Um, Kate Blanchett, uh, another actor on Veronica Guerin, for example. And was there anyone who stood out for you as just really sound, really down to earth? There was a number of them, but but the one that stood out for me that I suppose I got to know and got to you know just help out and do things for was uh, Yoan Griffin. He's a Welsh actor um, who was recently seen in, in in the TV series called Liar, which was fantastic. Um, also, he was in the the Madman and the Professor recently. Yoan was consummate professional and he was so nice to everyone but but that said the, the others were so nice to everyone as well but you could see that there was a bit of a bit of a diva in 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 some of them but i have to say that there's no one that i've worked with that i wouldn't want to work with again i remember speaking to uh, a chef who has his own restaurant great chef indeed and he was working in the film industry before and there was an actress from the show Baywatch who was in the movie and he was making breakfast, lunch and dinner for the cast and crew for a number of months. But this particular actress from Baywatch, she would have a kinder egg in the morning and she would have a kinder egg late afternoon, early evening. And that was it for the day. Wow. What a dream job working with the cast of Baywatch. <laughs> but who who like literally deprived themselves down to probably 400 calories per day that's amazing but the, the poor chef he's he's trained and qualified uh to the hilt to make the most amazing food and someone ends up uh, just having a kinder egg it's a bit of a <laughs> but without naming names was there any sort of bizarre sort of habits you came across on set yourself oh absolutely uh, in the office and on set, there are so many bizarre instances that um, 
it, there's definitely a book in it. But uh, you know, when you come across those moments, you you learn from them, and, and a lot of these things are in the heat of the moment, and you move on, you know, and people forget about them, and and I suppose you, you just you, you just crack on with it, and um, it's not for the faint-hearted, and you don't take things to heart, and you don't think take things personal and if you did you wouldn't you wouldn't stay long i suppose i i do ask myself sometimes how how i lasted well it's nearly just over 20 years now but but it has changed so much now um a lot of the things that were said and done 20 years ago or even 15 years ago you wouldn't see or hear them now it's it, it's just not acceptable um, and is that because of the me too campaign I think it's the whole anti-bullying and, the, the, you know, the cross kind of from the schools up, you know, the bullying campaigns that, 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 that take part all over the world. I think it's from that, really, because um, it, it wasn't specifically to do with Me Too, but it was just people talking to people with respect and, and, and um, people keeping their dignity in that. And I think... You know, people know now, and it's probably an old school thing, but people have moved on as well. So there's a newer breed there that, that know that, that asking or telling someone to do something in a way that used to be done before is not acceptable, that we're all employees and everyone needs to be um, treated properly. And was working in TV then less stressful, less egotistical compared to working in the movie industry? Um, well, the first part of your question was, is it more stressful? And I would say no. And then the second part, TV does have a different breed. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I took, I suppose, the decision for a while to, to take a break from films just because I was um, raising a family with my wife and... I wanted a bit more time off during the year or at home and TV seemed to be less hours. It was half nine to maybe half six. Um, I wasn't getting up at five or six in the morning and I wasn't coming home at 10 or 11 at night. Film hours are humongous. They're 70, 80 hours a week and TV is pretty much 50 or 55. So I slotted into working on TV then, just working on some RTE dramas or some RTE ob docs, and then went over then to do some work in the UK with Channel 4 and the BBC. And the hours there are very tight. Yeah, You go in at half nine, you have an hour for lunch, which you get, and you have to leave your desk, and you have to get out of the office by a certain time, like half six or so. And that's it. So you have, it's a great work-life balance in, in TV um, for pretty much the same money, you know. Let's just talk about COVID-19 because it has had a huge effect on the TV and the film industry. I mean, film, you know, as we know, has halted. Cinemas closed. Blockbuster movies that are finished have been rescheduled to later in the year. Film festivals are now streaming online this year. Like you've seen the major effect it has had really on the ground as well, but how has it kind of affected people personally, do you think? Well, I suppose I've been involved with the Production Guild in the UK and the Production Guild here in Ireland in a way that, you know, we have courses and with Screen Skills Ireland and, um, and people are getting to chat about their experiences on those courses. So if you're talking on a budgeting course or a scheduling course or a health and safety course, a little bit of the um, the current psyche is coming out on those courses. But from my feeling, uh, to talking to people, I think it's these courses and the keeping in touch with your colleagues and in the industry has kept people focused and kept people uh, mentally fit. But from talking to people, yeah, people are very, well, they're worried that, you know, that they mightn't go back to work for a while. Um, they're worried with the lack of finance coming in and funds. Um, and slightly worried about the the amount of work that will be required of them when they return because the workload will, you know, you could probably add another 50% onto our workload now, especially as a production manager because... 
are often referred to as a, head, a HOD or a head of department, which is the production department. But we are also responsible for all of the other, other departments. So production design and art department and costume and everything. We, we are responsible for the people who are responsible for those departments. So we, we're responsible for everybody. Uh, for their health and safety and for the budget and for the schedule and everything. And I think it's overwhelming at the moment because a huge addition has been given to us to look after the restrictions and the guidelines that are about to come in once approved and when we get the okay to go back to work. How is it going to work because at the moment i mean there's always more behind the camera than in front of the camera it's pretty packed and heavy with crew and then you have cast in front of the camera who are supposed to like for instance dirty girls season three got stopped halfway through the batman movie with robert patterson got stopped halfway through so these productions need to resume but still carry on with the same storyline and everything to look normal how's it going to be done so I suppose that's been worked out at the moment and pretty much almost there as to how how it may work in terms of the cast, in terms of the crew. And I've seen the UK proposals and I've seen the Irish ones and they're being proposed to the government uh, to be approved. And then once approved, then we can go back to work. Uh, same for commercials. I suppose the, the quick answer is, Nobody knows how it's going to work, but there's a good idea of how it's going to work. And certainly there are some mandatory things um, and elements in that crew won't all arrive at once in the morning for call time at eight. They will be staggered, so you'll get just what you need to get going in the morning. And then later, the second or third batch of crew will will arrive later and maybe the ones that came first will will leave a bit earlier so there'll be staggering of crew there'll be no breakfasts in the morning and um, there'll be no queues for catering there'll be no caterers in the morning there'll be tea and coffee and you'll be encouraged to bring your own tea and coffee and come fed because the production doesn't have time um, to orderly queue everyone feed everyone and sit down with safe distancing and clean up after everyone in the same way that they normally would have on any production, you know, before February. So there's two elements that are going to change. But in terms of on set, um, there will be about 40% less crew on the set. So anyone not required will be standing by in an area all keeping their you know their distance that, that that they need at the time of, of shooting whatever that might be at the time it might be one meter by the time we get back to work but on set it will be crew spread out um they will have their face masks and, and their and their hand covers and their gloves and in terms of cast then it's really at the moment what's been discussed is is, is the distancing and you know keeping that distance and, and how to shoot cleverly to keep them apart but i think there will be times where they'll have to come together um or come close but you know just to rewind a bit there's all the testing that will start in the morning and that will be two hours roughly to get a, a large cast and crew in filling out paperwork you know have you traveled anywhere in the last 14 days have you had any symptoms or have you been in, in, in contact with anyone who has symptoms? I suppose I, I was in the midst of this when I finished on uh, a Warner Brothers production I was on in April in the UK. We were one of the last to close down. Um, so we had been doing it for three weeks. We had been checking people. We had medics. We had paperwork on a daily basis. So we were checking people, and 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 we thankfully got got away with it in the sense that we n nobody was sick, uh, but but eventually we had to shut down. It sounds like an absolute nightmare. What's to come down the road for the industry? It is. It is because 
it just takes one or two key people to um, get sick or contract the virus and it could shut down the production for a few days. So when you have a production shutting down every couple of days or every week or for once a day, you know, that's a lot of people off work. It's a lot of equipment not being used. There's a lot of cost. So still trying to work out, you know, the payment issues around that. You know, if, if a cast member is gone and has to self-isolate for two weeks, but they're a key cast and we can't shoot. So the really big thing at the moment for everyone, what I'm hearing and seeing is insurance because there isn't an insurer at the moment who will insure a production starting up from today that will cover all the eventualities of what might happen in a COVID situation. So if your key actor gets sick and they're out for two weeks, self-isolating and getting better and you can't shoot, it's very hard to cover that under insurance for two weeks. And then the following week, someone else gets sick, your director can't shoot, you know, all the cast and crew are off and all the equipment. It, it's very hard to get all that covered at the moment. Um, so the money people are trying to work that out as to how that's going to happen. Because um, when you bring 100, 300 people together, the chances of, you know, someone getting sick are quite high if they're going home at night. You know, their family might be involved in the front line. They're going back to work the following day. So there's a lot of restrictions being put on us in that, you know, we can't really use public transport when we're going to work. We have to make our own way to work. We have to drive or cycle or because we could pick up something along the way that could infect the crew that could shut down the production. So it is a absolute nightmare of what, what has to happen in order for all of us to go back to work, you know, and I suppose there's about seven or 8,000 people who work in film and TV in Ireland. Um, two or 3,000 of them can work remotely in terms of post-production in different ways, but the core people have to be on set, and they're, that's a lot of people. Do you expect there to be job losses in the industry? I think there will be, I'd say, job losses, but it's it's more of a job pause. I was on a webinar yesterday in the UK with all the, the major companies and, and the companies that hire, and the big talk at the moment is job sharing, where a lot of the crew could potentially job share where you know they do three days and two days with someone else to minimize the amount of time that they need to be on a production and to I suppose maximize the time they can take off and 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 stay safe. So while jobs may decrease in terms of numbers, they may increase for the I suppose the possibilities so instead of having one production manager you might have two production managers but but they're doing three days and two days so it's it's a bit of a mix it's interesting there what you're saying about the job sharing and the stereotypical film set years ago was some fella leaning up against a ladder and someone wanted a bulb change or a switch turned off and he'd be like, no, that's not my job. You need to go over to that fella in the electrical department. This is my job in the electrical department or whatever. Uh, it was, ver- you know, there was this certain amount of arrogance. You know, the unions were really all about demarcation and this is what you do and you don't do that and you can't touch this. And like, could it, that whole culture change as well where really it needs to be more teamwork? I would say it needs to be more teamwork, but I suppose in my experience, it always really is teamwork and if that's the only thing that gets through the production is the teamwork but i suppose in in the example that you give it's probably a tricky example because if you're dealing with power and you're dealing with electricity and as a production manager if i saw anyone other than an electrician put up a ladder and go up it with someone holding it and changing a bulb or changing you know, anything to do with power, I'd be very cross at them unless they were electricians. So in that regard, 
where you're dealing with electricity and power, there's no quick fix. Uh, however, in a different department where you might have two or three people doing a project to get something done, maybe it might be a case where someone's in the workshop doing it and they pass it on and leave it somewhere and someone else picks it up and brings it to the next stage of fabrication. And then the person on set then goes and gets it and brings it to set. So I, I think there will be a, a bit of um, a situation where they won't be together in clusters, that someone will be off there doing that and they'll bring it to there and then it'll end up on set with that one person. Whereas traditionally, like I said, you might have two or three people huddle around something or other and they're all making it work and then it's on set. Those days, they're going to be gone. Absolutely. Yeah. Yesterday on our podcast, just like in the movies, we reviewed a Michael Bay movie that cost $150 million and it was absolute rubbish. Is the whole game financially going to change now in the sense of if insurance companies aren't playing ball, you can't be dealing with huge money on productions. The future of cinemas and on-demand home viewing is is changing. Like there's the backlash with AMC cinemas no longer showing uh, Universal Studio releases or so they are threatening anyways. Because the, the, the future distribution and consumption is going to change, do you think that will have a knockback effect then on budgets? I don't think that your example there will have effect on budgets um, because it's just a different way of visiting it and, and, and a different window. While, you know, I'd love to go to the cinema and watch it, I think, you know, those conditions are going to slow down and there's going to be conditions there with the seating and all of that. And I have read about the increase in the ideas of the outdoor cinemas and the drive-ins and that. That's certainly something that has been looked at by the major um, theatres here in, in, in Ireland uh, and in the UK. So that's the safe way to do it. Um, and after that, then you have, you know, the different windows through, you know, the Disney's and the, and the Netflix and so on. But I think, you know, everyone at the moment, as we know it, is watching and listening to everything at home. So they're, they're consuming it anyway. But when you talk about budgets, the budgets are going to increase by about 20%. For So if you had a film that was costing 100 million, you know, it's going to go up because of all the constraints and all the time and the schedule increases. Because when you take an hour or two out of the morning, uh, that's two hours less of filming. And there'll probably be an hour less at the end of the day as well for the kind of debriefing, de-cleaning, de-cleansing, sanitizing, all of that. And there'll also be no lunch break, more than likely. What you're going to see is a, a rolling lunch, uh, a continuous day where, you know, you don't stop work to let people congregate and, and eat and, you know, hang out. Um, you'll have a shorter shoot day, but you'll have a staggered lunch where people will get to break themselves, but staggered, and they will get to eat, but they'll be handed a box uh, with all sorts of everything in it and go off and eat it, um, but, or, or maybe given an allowance uh, um, to go off and get their lunch somewhere. But the numbers are going to go up on the, on the people because you're going to have extra medics you can have specific COVID supervisors on all productions. If budgets are going to increase by 20%, which is understandable based on the points there that you made, I suppose the knock-on effect then for the consumer is we could possibly expect cinema tickets to, in the price of cinema tickets to increase, Netflix, Disney+, Plus, their subscription fee to increase, TV licenses to increase, to meet those shall we say, necessary costs now of film and TV productions? Well, that is one way of looking at it. And that I, I personally, I don't see that happening. I, I think the studios and the companies, the larger ones, will, will they'll just have to suck it up. So instead of making 100 million <laughs> profit, they might make 80, but they're still making good money on a big production. The smaller independence is, is where it's going to be tricky, the one or two million 
co-productions with Ireland and Germany and the UK where they're really going to have to be clever with their budgets. So, you know, have less people because of the virus, but have more people in certain areas to cover the, the checks and balances that need to be done. You're going to have 20% extra of shooting days. So if you had a, a four-week schedule, you're going to have a, an additional week now to do it. You also have issues around flights and stuff. So if you have an actress or an actor from the UK coming in, our crew, you know, they at the moment they have to self-isolate for two weeks before they can start work and come on set. So it's working out, well, where do they stay when they come? If, you know, the actor comes over, where do they stay for two weeks? And who pays them for two weeks while they self-isolate? And then we have to hold them here for the six weeks of the film. We can't send them back midway because they have two weeks off. They have to stay here. So, we, you know, there'll be extra per diems and hotel accommodation, etc. And, you know, you're going to have to pay them while they're here as well because, you know, you're holding them and you might use them. So that's where the extra costs are going to be because traditionally they would have gone home on a Friday um, and came back the following Monday week. And you were talking about, you know, smaller budget movies that are one to two million and it made me think of short films as well. Like on either of those, you're you're still talking really about the same sort of crew numbers. I mean, if you want to do a good short film, you know, you, you do possibly need maybe 30 crew members at various stages throughout the production of a short film. Similarly, lo- that you'd be looking at in terms of a low budget feature film. They're different budgets. That's really the difference between them and, and the final length of them. But how are short films? going to survive with all these restrictions and such a limited budget? Well, I think with short films, there was always, I suppose, you know, your your core crew or the crew that you had. And really, if, and we've all worked on them, so if we were to think, we probably could have always shaved off maybe five or six and club together and work together to get it done if you didn't have those. Not, not that anyone isn't important, it's just that if given the condition that you can't have them, then you know you get on with it. So that's going to happen. But again, it's it's insurance. You know, finding an insurer to insure a thirty thousand short film that if it stops, you know, because whether it's short or long, you know, it it's it's health and safety. It's it's people's lives, and and that's the bottom line. If someone's been on set for two days, and then they get sick. And then they're seen or, you know, tested to have the virus. You know, you have to shut down for a day and, and test everyone and, and see, does everyone else have it? And, you know, there's so many protocols that have to be done just for basic health and safety. But, you know, with short films, I think you're going to have people going, listen, I won't charge you for next Monday and Tuesday because I know we were shut down last Tuesday and Wednesday because of this. So I think you're going to have people understanding you know that you know you have the equipment for an extra few days and you have people for an extra few days you know that will be willing to um to see it through for the producer director without charging extra finally then to kind of wrap up you are shooting on a warner brothers production in the uk back in april have you any idea when you return to work so the talks at the moment are back shooting in july so it'll be, I suppose, going over to the UK for a bit and self-isolating, uh, even though the law doesn't say over there that you can have to for Ireland. Um, you know, there, there's company policies and there's insurance policies that won't mitigate someone traveling over. So personally, I'd be self-isolating for two weeks, getting my clean bill of health and then starting work then to prep probably from home and then shooting then for a number of weeks after that uh, and working the health and safety and the medics and the, and the, and the COVID specialists to, to keep the production COVID safe, if you like, or COVID free. Um, that's a job in itself, along with call sheets and making sure everyone gets there and getting your shooting day and everything going right. I mean, it's hard enough as it is without um, 
the extra layer of uh, of this. But it's it's it, it has to happen. It's very important, obviously, and uh, it's uh, it's changed everything forever. <laughs> as long as it's around, anyway, you know, there may be a time, hopefully, where it's it's gone. There's no traces around, and you know, restrictions will be eased. But for the moment, they're the issues. Okay, well, it's uh, we'll be, we'll be as positive as possible. Interesting times ahead, I suppose, for those working on set and then the end result for those sitting in probably a sparse cinema uh, to watch the movie if they're not doing so at home. But yeah, we just got to roll with the punches. Uh, Adrian Devan, thanks a million for joining us on Gary Talks for a very insightful discussion about the future of the film, TV and animation industry. Thank you, Gary. Thanks again to Adrian for joining us on Gary Talks. If you would like to be part of the show and join the conversation, you can find us online. Also, quick plug again, if you need any help in digital content or marketing solutions, please follow GK Media on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn or check out our website, gkmedia.ie. Most importantly, please subscribe to this podcast. Stay safe, stay sane.